Greetings everyone. Welcome back into Calc 2. Time to continue with advanced integration techniques. Next in line uh, is integrating a lot of the advanced trigonometric structures that can happen uh, commonly with uh, integrals. So what we're talking about is we can have uh, combinations of multiplications of trig functions and instead of trying to deal with these things all of the time like products or trying to deal with them with by parts or, or different other advanced structures than that, we can simply try to approach these trig integrals using our knowledge of trigonometric identities and, uh, and other basic structures to just rearrange the integral and get around the, the problem of the integral itself. Okay, so got a, some, some basic little guidelines here for you, which you could probably read in any calculus book and, uh, listed in the OpenStax book too. If you, um, if you have a sine and cosine, but they have the same argument, okay, uh, when, the, when they're the same argument, um, then, then all you need to do is be able to convert back and forth. If either of the exponents on those are odd, then basically you have uh, something waiting for a substitution. Whichever one is odd, you take that one of those pieces and save one. So if, if sine is odd, then take one of those signs, not the whole grouping, and save one for your substitution. And then you're just going to let, uh, so if you save a sign, you would let u equal cosine, and you can do a substitution, or vice versa. Okay, so if either one of them are odd, then you're just going to take that odd extra out and then do some conversions uh, of, of something into the other one, right? So if sine was odd, you'd save a sine, let u equal cosine, and then convert all of the other signs into cosines so that everything would uh, work out, okay? Um, so if anything, you know, if any of the powers are odd, you can, you can do that, and that's most of them. But in the chance that both A and B are even, okay, and by the way, these can be negative powers, these can be fractional powers, we're talking about, you know, just the overall numerator of the thing here, then you're going to want to use what we call the power reduction formulas if A and B are even at the same time. Um, sine squared is the 1 half 1 minus cosine of 2x, and cosine squared is 1 half 1 plus cosine 2x. And then whenever, whenever you're bringing all of those powers down, you notice you're going from a sine squared down to a cosine, cosine squared down to a cosine, and then you're gonna multiply everything out. And it does make several terms to integrate, but it does make it easy uh, to deal with the individual pieces. All right, so then same thing kind of goes for secant and tangent, but you just gotta remember what your antiderivative or just derivative rules for secant and tangent are, okay? So don't forget, the, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, and the derivative of secant is secant times tangent. So these are the kinds of things that you should be looking for to do your substitutions, right? So right here, if the power on your tangent, right here, m, is odd, okay, then you're gonna wanna save one of your tangents and secants together, right? So that's a secant times a tangent. You're just gonna save those. You would convert the rest of your tangents into secants, and then let u equal secant, because the derivative of the secant is the secant times a tangent. Vice versa, if your n, right here, the power on the secant is even, okay? then you're going to want to save one of your secant squares because that's the derivative of tangent. Convert the rest of your secants into tangents and then let u equal tangent. Okay, so you see how we're just using our basic Pythagorean for the most part on, on a lot of these things to convert things back and forth so that you can basically pile them all up into one type. But don't forget to save any of the pieces that you need, like a secant times a tangent or a secant squared, in order to make your substitution work later. Okay, now, in the off chance that uh, you don't have any secants and your tangent exponent happens to be even, not odd, okay, then you can convert a single tangent squared 
into secant squared minus one. And that secant squared will give you the u sub that you need where u is equal to tangent. Uh, and it's possible if you have a really high exponent that's even on your tangent that you may have to do several stages of that particular one, okay? Uh, also, with secant and tangent, if you've gone through and tried different things, um, if all else fails, just convert everything into sines and cosines from the secants and tangents, and you'd basically be back into you know, the, this category over here, okay? And for both of these categories, always, always, Take a step back for a second. Think also about, just, 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 just use your mind to problem solve this, to like a puzzle, okay? The, these little guidelines here are nothing more than something you've probably seen a thousand times uh, using Pythagorean identities to convert secants into tangents, tangents into secants, sines into cosines, vice versa, all that, okay? Um, these are good guidelines, but also use your noodle, right? problem solve and figure out the patterns that make sense to you and then you won't be memorizing rules which is which is bad for you you know you should be piecing these things together um and the last category over here is one of the lesser used trig identities until you get to calculus and that is the the sine and cosine products that can be converted into sums so if we happen to have signs that are multiplied, but their arguments are different. That can be a problem because I can't u sub one or the other, right? There's no way to do both. And so we have a uh, identity of uh, sine times sine here, where you can convert it into a subtraction of two cosines, right? Or cosine times a cosine also, it's to be an addition of two cosines. Notice all that's going to change are these coefficients. You have a minus b, you have a plus b. But it doesn't matter because since they're added and subtracted, or in this case adding of two signs, it's two quick and easy integrals of, oh, here's a sign, here's a sign, right? You can just separate out the integral at that point. So if you have different arguments, then you can definitely split them up like that. Okay? So these are just the, the guidelines. Now, let's go take a look at some examples. First set of examples that I want to talk about are with the sines and cosines. Probably the most common ones you would expect, right? Okay, so I have the integral of cosine cubed times sine to the fourth. Cosine cubed x, sine to the fourth x dx. So we want to do this antiderivative. So I'm looking at this and I'm noticing that the cosine exponent is odd. All right? So with my Pythagorean identities, I can easily convert even powers, like squares and fourth powers, but odd powers are a little bit harder, right? So instead, the odd power, that's where I need to save one, and that turns it into an even power. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna convert some of them. I'm gonna split this up into a cosine squared times a cosine like this, and I'm gonna take this extra cosine here and I'm just gonna save it over on the other side, okay? This cosine right here is gonna help me do my substitution later. So then this is equal to the integral. Cosine squared, this guy right here, is equal to one minus sine squared x, like that. I already had sine to the fourth, like so. And then I saved a cosine x dx, like so. Okay, so at this point, I now let u equal sine x, which means du is gonna be equal to cosine x dx. And looky, looky, that's what I saved, right? The cosine x dx is exactly what's gonna work out for my substitution here. And so everywhere there's a sign, I'm just gonna have a u. This is gonna be equal to the integral of one minus u squared times u to the fourth du. 
by doing this substitution here. And the rest is just power rules now. I'm going to distribute the u to the fourth. So I have u to the fourth minus u to the sixth du. I do my power rules there, which is going to give me uh, one fifth u to the fifth minus one seventh u to the seventh plus c plus c. And now I can come back to where my u was equal to sine x. So I have one fifth sine to the fifth x minus one seventh sine to the seventh x plus c. And then I've got my integral complete. Okay. Next, I'm noticing that I have technically an odd power for cosine and an odd power for sine, but since cosine is in the slightly more interesting structure, I'm probably going to try and mess more with the, the sine than the cosine. All right. First thing I notice is uh, cosine is in a square root, and I know that cosine can sometimes put out negative values, but from negative pi over three to zero, Cosine is positive, all right? That's, uh, that's quadrant four evaluation pieces, and cosine is positive in quadrant four. So we can handle that uh, square root, no problem. I'm going to convert this negative pi over three to zero, and I have cosine to the one half x, and I have times sine squared, times sine x dx. Again, because sine is the object that had the odd power, I am saving one of my sines for the substitution later. And then the other, the rest of the sines, I'm going to convert into cosines. So I have integral from negative pi over three to zero, cosine, to the one half x times one minus cosine squared x, and then I have sine x dx. Okay, so then at this point, I let u equal cosine x. Therefore, my du is going to be negative sine x dx. I don't have a negative, so instead I will just multiply that negative to the other side to make it a negative du is equal to sine x dx. So then I have my integral of u to the one half times one minus u squared times negative du. Okay. Now, because of the way the, the, the cosines and sines work, I'm just going to do the integration with the u's, and then I'm going to come back out into the, into the land of cosines before I plug in my values. So you'll notice that I'm leaving it blank, no, no limiting values, because I'm just not bothering to convert the, the values of the u. You could do it. Uh, I'm just choosing this time to not con uh, convert the numbers, and then I'll just bounce them back out and plug them in afterwards. So if I distribute this negative and distribute the u to the one half, I'm going to have an integral of u to the five halves, that's going to be two plus one half, minus u to the one half du. So I distributed this in, but the negative reversed the subtraction, let's see. Now I do my antiderivative, which is going to land me in u to the 7 halves, so that's 2 sevenths u to the 7 halves, uh, minus 2 thirds u to the 3 halves. And of course, normally that'd be a plus c here, but we're also plugging in values, right? 
So I've got uh, two sevenths cosine to the seven halves uh, x minus two thirds cosine to the three halves x. And this is being evaluated from negative pi over three to zero. Alrighty. So when I plug in zero for cosine x, I get one. So for my first go around, I'm gonna have just two sevenths minus two thirds. All right, because you know one to any power is itself, one to the seven halves, one to the three halves, and then anything times one, right? Now minus the lower number, I'm gonna plug in negative pi over three into cosine x. So let's see, I'm gonna have two sevenths. Cosine of negative pi over three is the same thing as cosine of pi over three, right? Because in either quadrant, cosine is gonna be positive. Uh, cosine of pi over three, cosine of 60 degrees is a half, right? So I have two sevenths times one half to the seven halves power, like so. Minus two thirds, and then that's gonna be uh, one half to the three halves power, like so. Alrighty. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to factor out a 2 here. Well, actually, I'll just go ahead and combine these. Uh, 2 sevenths minus 2 thirds is going to give me 6 minus 14. Um, so that's going to be negative 8 over 21, right? Because 6 minus 14 is negative 8. Uh, now, minus here, I'm going to factor out a 1 half to the 3 halves power. So that's going to give me a 1 half to the 3 halves power because I'm factoring that out of both of these. Um, also, I can factor a 2 out. So let me do that also uh, times 2. <clears throat> okay. And then that's going to leave me with 1 seventh and then I took three halves out of this, which is going to leave me with four halves, which is really just squared, right? So that's one half squared. And then just minus one third, because I took the two out of that also. Okay. Ooh, running out of space. So I have negative 8 over 21. Uh, let's see, 1 half to the 3 halves. And then the 2 here is to the 2 halves. So we can definitely combine those. I've got minus. Uh, that's just going to be 2 halves minus 3 halves, which is negative 1 half. Okay. So that's 1 over 2 to the 1 half power, just the square root of 1 half, times, and then I'm going to combine this here. This is 7 times 4, so 28, and then, of course, minus the 1 third. So I'm just going to end up with 3 minus 28, which is going to be negative 25 over 3 times 28. Uh, 60 and 24 is 84. Whew, this is a real yummy answer. This looks like uh, right here, this negative will make this positive. And that's about as far as I'm going to want to take that. That's about as yummy as you're going to want to get. But you get the main idea, right? 
of, of doing this part right here, getting the, the integration done. Okay. Now what happens when you want to approach an integral where both of the powers are even? Okay. So then what we're going to have to do is use the power reduction formulas. And of course if these were higher exponents then I would have to do it several times and multiply out several uh, different uh, binomials. As it is, this is going to be two binomials that I'm going to have to multiply out. So let's see, I've got the integral, and it's going to be one half, and I've got one plus cosine two x, because that's cosine squared is equal to this. Uh, again, times a half, because sine squared, and then it's one minus cosine two x, the x. All right. So then uh, one half and one half gives me one quarter, and then I have an integral, and I'm going to multiply these two binomials. So one times one, one times cosine two x, negative. Of course, these are conjugates, so you may notice that I'm gonna add these out to zero, and then I'm left with a minus cosine squared uh, 2x, the x. So the integral of the 1 is not bad, but again, I have an integral of something squared, which I don't actually have a, a, a nice clean way of doing by itself. So because I yet again have a cosine squared, I'm going to use one more power reduction so I've got one-fourth integral, one minus uh, this minus right here. And I'm going to use a power reduction here. So the square, that's going to give me one-half of one plus. Now remember, when you're doing a cosine squared, you get one plus cosine two x. That's because this was just x. Now I'm doing this to a two x, so it's going to be one plus cosine four x. I used a power reduction formula on something that already had a double angle. So I got a double, double angle, dx. All right. Then from here, I've got one fourth um, integral of, this is going to be one minus one half. So I've got one half plus one-half cosine four x dx, which of course I can just factor out the one-half. So I have one-eighth times the integral of one plus cosine four x dx. Now I can just do straightforward antiderivative rules. So I have one-eighth times x plus one-fourth sine four x plus c. So if you have nothing but even powers to work with, you've got to keep doing your power reduction formulas until all of your squares are gone, right? Uh, of course, you might say, hey, why don't I just use Pythagorean and convert it? Yeah, that'd be great, except you get a cosine to the fourth, you'd have to power reduce that twice, so you're gonna end up doing multiple levels of it anyway. It's best just to attack it straight on with the power reduction formulas right away. Okay. Next set of examples here are gonna be with the tangents and secants, but the ideas are pretty much the same. It's just you have to look out for different uh, things to save if you're gonna do those substitutions. Okay, so just keep your eyes out for the, the different antiderivative pieces you need. Integral of tangent cubed times secant x dx. Okay, so again, I've got that odd number for the tangent. And uh, I know that for secant, the 
derivative is secant x times tangent x. And it looks to me like if I were to separate this out like that, I would have exactly the right number of secants and tangents. In other words, like this, tangent squared times tangent times secant dx. If I save this piece right here, then that's the derivative of secant x. And I can easily convert tangent squared into something with just secant. So this will work out perfectly for that kind of substitution, right? So first thing I'm gonna do is convert that tangent squared into secant squared x minus one. And then I still have the tangent x times the secant x dx. I let u equal secant x, therefore du will be equal to secant x times tangent x dx, which I have. So then my integral simply becomes the integral of u squared minus one times du, like so which very quickly becomes the antiderivative, one third u cubed minus u plus c. And of course, u is equal to secant x. So I have one third secant cubed x minus secant x plus c, right? So like I was saying, it's all about noticing what derivative pieces you need and then letting the rest of it fall into the substitution pattern that it's supposed to. Okay, so here I see a secant to the fourth and a tangent. All right, well, I know that the derivative of secant, uh, I'm sorry, the derivative of tangent of uh, 5x is going to be a secant squared 5x, well, along with the extra 5s, right? So I'm going to save two of the secants. I'm going to have secant squared 5x times tangent 5x times secant squared 5x dx. And this is the part I'm saving because the derivative of the tangent eventually will be secant squared, and I can easily convert secant squared into something with just tangent. So let's do that. I'm going to convert secant squared now, integral. I have tangent squared of 5x plus 1 times tangent of 5x times secant squared of 5x dx. Now I let my u equal the tangent function that I've got, tangent 5x, which means that du is going to be 5 times secant squared of 5x dx. I don't have a 5, so I'm just going to have to create one and balance it out. Right? I'll multiply a 5 in, which means I'll balance it out with a 1 fifth out front. All right. So now I've got 1 fifth integral u squared plus 1 times u times du. Here's the u. Here's the u squared plus 1, right? There's du. And then again, this just becomes a bunch of power rules. One fifth integral u cubed plus u du. So then I have one fifth times one fourth u to the fourth plus one half u squared and all of that plus c. And then of course, the, um, the u's are equal to tangent of 5x. So altogether, I've got 1 over 20 tangent to the fourth of 5x 
plus 1 over 10, right? Tangent squared of 5x plus c. Right? Okay, and then on this last one here, it doesn't really fit any of the, of the suggestions exactly. But remember what I said, use your noodle. Think about these things and problem solve them. In this particular case, if I were to convert the tangent squared into secant squared x minus one, then a lot of the stuff will just collapse and become something very easy to integrate. So for example, I get secant squared x minus one over secant x dx. From here I can separate the secant being underneath each one of those. So that leaves me with just secant minus one over secant, like so. But we should know what one over secant x is. I now have an integral of secant x minus cosine x, like so. And both of those are straightforward antiderivatives that we've discussed in the past. Okay, so I've got the ln of the absolute value of secant x plus tangent x. That's the antiderivative of secant x minus the antiderivative of cosine x being sine x, and then of course plus c. So not all of these need a bunch of a bunch of fancy you know substitutions or whatever. It's all in what you see and what you can make the, the trig identities work out for you, okay? So to finish up this short discussion on trig structures, let's take one quick look at what happens when you wanna multiply or when you need to multiply two trig functions like mostly sines and cosines that have different arguments, um, different simple arguments. This is very common when you want to start studying Fourier analysis. We have different wave functions that are acting simultaneously and, and such and so forth. Um, Fourier analysis used a lot in physics, quantum mechanics, stuff like that. So um, these kind of integrals are rather essential, especially for a lot of science applications. All right, so I'm just going to use the identity that we have. That's really all it takes. So right here, I'm just going to convert this into, I've got the one half, I'm going to have the integral, and then I'm going to have the cosine of 9 minus 5, so cosine of 4x, minus the cosine of 9 plus 5, right, so 14x dx. And that's really all there is to it now because these are two subtracted cosines here, which means I can do the integrals independently, right? So I just have one half times uh, one fourth sine four x minus one fourteenth sine fourteen x plus c. Those are pretty straightforward. You just have to know that these particular uh, trig identities exist to be able to do those. So I hope this has helped you realize the different ways that we can manipulate trigonometric structures for the usage of integrals. And this is very essential because in the very next section, we're gonna learn how to convert integrals into trig form when they weren't there before because that gives us a lot of benefits. So being able to do trigonometric integrals is essential.